on, no, come on, come on. We're going to do it. Let's do it. We're going to talk about worship within the context of spiritual revival. Because uh, this is what we're going for. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your presence here. We thank you that you can do more than we can see with our eyes. And we pray that we would see it today in the mighty name. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let's, uh, we're going to read a familiar passage of scripture here. Um, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost had come, if you've been in this church for a little bit, you probably heard this verse <laughs> once or twice. Ha. Huh. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Wouldn't you like that today? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. Because amen to the reading of the word? I got saved um, in my uh, mid to late 20s. I, I really need to just memorize when it was. Uh, I, I know that I did get saved. I'm not always positive exactly when it was, if that's, if that's fair, uh, but I do know that I am saved. I do know that. Uh, and uh, when, I got, when I got saved, uh, I grew up a heathen, uh, and uh, I, I, I got saved halfway through college after um, living, uh, being in the military for six and a half years. And um, uh, I grew up, uh, much like Brianna said, uh, with was kind of an orphan tendencies. I moved out of my house when I was 14, didn't grow up in the best home. Um, I don't blame my parents. I owned a Bible and I could read, so there really was no reason for me to be a heathen. Uh, but um, but as, as it were, I didn't grow up a good person, uh, if that makes sense. And, um, <clears throat> and when I got saved, I got saved into a fairly controlling church. Uh, and uh, I think they, they thought they were doing their best, um, but, but it, was a, it was a fairly controlling church. And uh, I immediately became hungry for the power of Holy Spirit. And the uh, Lord was, uh, he was very faithful to me. And uh, not only was he faithful, he was gracious. And in his graciousness, he allowed me to be filled and operate in signs and wonders pretty, pretty quickly. And I, I um, very quickly in my walk began to see God do amazing things through me and my friends. It's a lot of incredible healings and um, just, just really, really amazing stuff outwardly. Now, since I was not a great person, and uh, I didn't grow up with a great family, and I didn't grow up with a lot of love, I, I grew up fairly judgmental and distrusting, and uh, my personality type didn't help in that. And so, um, my personality type helped me survive my childhood, but wasn't a great father, if that makes sense. And so, as I began to operate in signs and wonders, I was still bitter, distrustful, and judgmental. And if you've ever uh, met a spirit-filled person who has not been healed, you understand why they're so uh, um, uh, pessimistic about the end times, because they believe God is as angry as they feel inside. And um, that's, that, 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 was, that, was, that was me. Um, I, I, that was probably bigger than I meant it to be, but I think it's fairly accurate. And so the, the, the chaos on the inside, we tend to assign to God. And so I was um, living with this chaos on the inside, this, this dissettlement, this, um, this, this unhealed, hurt, fear of abandonment man. And uh, God is not, does not operate in fear of abandonment. He really is not. He does not have any orphan tendencies, right? He has never been orphaned. He is fully trusting. He's fully loving. He's fully accepting. He just believes the best all the time, so much better than me. And uh, in America, we grow up in a culture where you are what you do. You are what you do. So if what you do is successful, then you are successful. A way to describe a husband in America is a good provider. And what that means is I have a good husband because he's wealthy. Right? And somehow that's better than the guy who doesn't make a lot of money but is at every ball game, 
right, and is teaching his kids to swim and, and, and is a loving husband, you know, like somehow in our culture, this, this my success defines me, my outward success defines me. And so when you have people in the church who never were much of anything before they got Jesus, when they start accomplishing something through Jesus, they start to think that things are good. I hope that makes sense. So the fact that we operate in miracle signs and wonders somehow validates who we are internally. Does that? And so there's a lot of people who preach really, really goofy stuff, but they got miracles, and so they think that, that the miracles confirm their doctrine. When, as we know, the miracles confirm that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Now, you could say Jesus Christ rose from the dead and... Uh, and, and and donuts don't taste good. That doesn't mean donuts don't taste good. Right? So if you're seeing miracles and you don't believe in the power of eating donuts, then you're, you're in error, but you're seeing miracles because Jesus is alive. Right? Let's, let's, let's not get crazy. Right? Like, let's just focus on what's true. Right? Right? And so, and so in, the, in, the, in the charismatic church, we have this really bad bad history of, of, of winking at goofiness because people have miracles. Now, if you operate in miracle signs and wonders all the time, you're going to get a little goofy because you're living in another world. And so we have grace for the prophets who see crazy stuff all the time, right? Like we just have grace for them. We just say, yeah, that's, wow, oh, okay, you're seeing stuff. That's great. Let's try to figure, let's try to help you with some language for that stuff so people can actually listen to you. Uh, but what we do is, unfortunately, we, we start to say, since I'm successful in my Christian stuff, that means I'm a good Christian, if I can use that language, when God is really trying to do more than use you. God is really trying to do more than use you. God is really trying to, um, he's really trying to go for relationship. And so we, we, we studied last week, if, if you were here, we studied uh, on being clothed with power. Do you remember that? We talked about being clothed with power. Um, we talked about how um, we went through the provenance to show that all throughout history, God put his spirit on people and they started doing amazing things. Talked about how uh, Moses received the presence of God upon him. And that he put part of it on Joshua. You remember that uh, he put it uh, on the seventy. Received part of the anointing, the glory that was on Moses. He put on them. And uh, the Bible says how he laid hands on Joshua, and Joshua received the anointing. And how uh, Samuel went to Saul and poured an oil on his head, and the and the anointing came upon him. And Saul was uh, anointed to be king, and he started prophesying. But how many of you know Saul had the anointing on him, but he didn't manage it well? Because there were internal things that were never dealt with. Right? And, and, we, and, we, and we see it uh, all the time. And uh, we talked about how the charismatic manifestation of the Spirit upon you is a confirmation for you experientially, a confirmation for you that you've been anointed and a confirmation for the people around you. It's a sign that, hey, the Lord is on this person. Now, Jesus told us we're supposed to use that sign to let people know that he's alive. Unfortunately, we also use that sign to say that there's something about me that's amazing. Right? We see it everywhere. I mean, we, we, we're, we're, we're not a massive church, but you can play bass on this worship team and think that since people are getting in touch, you're amazing. I'm not saying it's not because of you, Brandon. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's totally not what I'm saying. <clears throat> but as a church, Revival Life Church, as a leadership team, we've been really praying through who we are and what we do. And we feel like the call on our house, and, and, and we're really emphasizing, the call in our house is to explain, teach, and uh, get people uh, in contact with the presence and power of God. That's who we are. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to knock any church that during this month is talking about the, the deeper spiritual revelation in Toy Story 4, right? But what, we're, but what we're doing is we feel like we're called to teach people about the presence and power of God, right? Like this is, this, this is, this is who we are. Um, and we feel a, a great need to teach about what's coming. So when, when it happens, people are ready, right? And that people don't start deifying people because the presence of God starts move, moving on them in a significant way. Uh, and what that means is starting you know, treating people like they're gods because they have the presence and power that they operate in. Because we believe the presence and power is coming in a significant way. 
And here is the challenge I want you guys to get. As important as it is to get the anointing on you, you cannot live off of what's on you. You cannot live off of what's on you. What's on you is for others. What's in you is for you. <clears throat> what we're really looking for is the transformation of the inner man, personally. God would rather you never raise the dead and you never, if I could be honest with you, he'd rather you never lead anyone to Jesus or bring anyone to church and you get whole and go to heaven. That would be, that'd be God's, God's heart is that you actually be saved and you walk in fellowship with him. Now, I believe he wants us to bring the entire world to church, right? I believe he wants the entire world to be saved. I absolutely believe that theologically. He wants us to touch the entire world. But he does not want you to touch the entire world and then you live a broke, spiritually destitute life. That is not his heart. As a father, that is not his heart for you. As a father, he wants you to live in communion with him. And, uh, and, and he actually has a bigger call on your life than invite people to church. He actually has a bigger call on your life than do miracle signs and wonders. The bigger call is to be a daughter of God. The bigger call is to be a son of God. This is the greatest call on your life. And in a day and age where every um, pastor is trying to be an apostle, uh, and every pastor, every minister thinks they're a pro- I mean, like everybody, I, 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 like, I don't know, there's a factory where they're pumping them out somewhere. I don't know. Everybody's an apostle or a prophet these days, Mike. I don't, I don't get it. Jesus was a good shepherd, right? He was a pastor. And, 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 and people get the world system on them, and they try to be something bigger than Jesus was. Jesus was happy to be a shepherd. Uh, there's, there's something about just being humble, and I want, I, I just want to be whole. I just want to be a healthy person and help people be healthy. There's something about that. There's something about that that God wants to, like, just do. Um, <clears throat> and so there is this promise that God would come upon us in power, and we believe it, and I want it for all of you. I want you all to be a revival waiting to happen wherever you go. Just a revival waiting to happen wherever you go. And some of you are, and I, and I, and I love that. Uh, but I also want to talk about the other half of God's promise for us today, okay? I want to talk about the other half of that promise. So we're going to go through a bunch of scripture again to get today. This is going to be more of a teaching than a preach, but I think it's going to be good because I believe the Spirit of God is here. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're going to again go back into Genesis chapter 28. And there's a guy named Jacob, and Jacob was actually running from his problems uh, like Travis in the offering teaching. He was not dealing with his problems well, uh, and yet and still God was good. Amen? <clears throat> Have you ever had God be good to you in the midst of your mess up and be like, I, I just... Has that ever been you? You're like, are you still, are you really, did you really just come through for me? Are you serious? Who are you, right? Who are you that you would be good to me in the midst of how I'm behaving? How is that, is that, is that just me or like, what? Like I wrote you off and you're still coming through for me? Wow, I've never written off God, but you know what I'm saying. I'm just being funny. All right, Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse 12. Let's read this. He says, a Jacob, he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord. Now, this is, this is, this is significant. And this has some very significant uh, things for us to get for today. Now, what we see here is uh, we see uh, this man who didn't know that he was in God's presence. And the Lord began speaking to him through a dream. He uh, saw angels going up and down. And the Lord told him, I am the Lord. And immediately after God identified himself to him, he started giving Jacob some promises about his children, about his future, and he told him that his family would be blessed, right? So moving on to verse 15, God continued to say, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised for you. Now, God did not put any conditions on that promise. That is just so amazing of him, right? So let's move on. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did, mm, and I did not know it. 
He was afraid, Jacob was, and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now, I need you to see that he was not in a church building. They had not built the temple yet. They had not even built the tabernacle. There weren't the people to build it. There was no building. As a matter of fact, he was in the desert with a rock that he laid his head on. That's all he had. He went to sleep with a rock on his head. There was no worship team. Corey's anointed broken guitar was not there. It was just him and God. And Jacob said that this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. What made it the house of God and the gate of heaven? This is important for us to answer as we move forward. There's a couple things that let us know when we are in the house of God and the gate of heaven. Here's three of them. Uh, we see the presence of God. Now, that's pretty important. It's pretty important when you say you're in God's house, God should be there, right? Now, we take that as kind of a given in the church today. I've been in where God used to live at times. You know what I mean? Like, like you can go on these Hollywood tours, and they're like, you know, James Dean lived here. But if you see him there, that's just a ghost, right? Like, he's not really there anymore. Is that, is that, does that make sense? So I've been places where God used to live. But the presence of God is, 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 is an indicator like, when you're in the house of God, these are things that you can expect. There's the presence of God. There is angelic activity in the house of God. Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending, right? There's the voice of God. When you're in the house of God, you can expect to hear the voice of God. You can expect to tangibly experience His presence, right? If you come to my house and I invite you over and I don't talk to you the whole time, that's going to be weird, Right? If you invite me over to your house, it would be a miracle because none of y'all do. What, what's going on here? What? <laughs> Corey invites me over. I don't No, I'm joking. I get invited lots of places. But if you get invited over to somebody's house and they don't talk to you, that's weird, right? You would never think, well, they're just too important for me. You would not go back. Have you ever been invited over to someone's house and they weren't good hosts? It's weird, right? It's awkward. God is a very good host. He talks to people in his house. And all his people are there with him. God travels with an entourage. They're his angels. Have you ever met anybody important and then they're just like solo? It's weird. You're like, you're here by yourself? That's so weird. God never travels alone. His angels are always there. Now, this isn't weird. This is just Bible. Right? The God, I mean, it wasn't like Jacob was leaning into something. God showed up, the angels are there, the voice is there, the presence is there. And he says, huh, this must be the house of God. Right? What else do we see? The house of God is a meeting place of the divine and the natural realm. He said, this is the gateway of heaven. The, gate, the house of God should be the gateway of of heaven. Think of the implications of that. Think of the, that means like heaven extends to wherever God is. This is the gateway of heaven. The house of God is the gateway of heaven. It's where heaven, the divine and the natural meet. Right, is this making sense? It's not just like, you know, we're having, we're having church and, and, and we're, I mean, we're not having church. Is God here or not? Are we in the house of God or are we not? Right? Okay. I don't want to get it myself. I feel like this is good stuff. <clears throat> and so what happens when you actually encounter an actual house of God? What, what happens when you actually encounter a divine space? A divine space. Right? Let's, let's go on with our verse here. Uh, Genesis 28, verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, a natural response. 
Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me on this journey, basically if God will keep his word and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, verse 21, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. First thing that happens, when, when the house of God is there, people, they, the people who don't know God recognize it. You don't have to convince them. You don't, you don't have to paint pictures. You, you, don't, you, you don't have to dumb it down. You don't have to hide the Holy Ghost in the back room. You don't have to tell the angels don't show up. You don't have to say don't waste people, too much people's time. When it is the house of God, you do not have to worry about God embarrassing himself. The man saw angels going up and down in a, a ladder. He's like, this must be the house of God. I will give my life to this. All he said was, if you make sure I don't die of starvation before I get home. I'll, I'm like, basically saying, as long as I'm alive, when I get there, I'll, I'll worship you. Saying, if I die, I won't be able to, right? Like, <laughs> if you just keep me alive long enough to get home, then you'll be my God. Right? Not, not a high threshold to meet here, right? Verse 22. This stone, like, this is what people do. Watch this. This stone I have set up as a pillar. Like, because he had nothing else. Like, here's the rock I was laying on. This, this will be a memorial of the living God who speaks and bridges heaven and earth and angels come up. This stone will be a pillar. This will be God's house. <laughs> and of all that you give me, I surely will give a tenth to you. So what he did was he got the rock that he used as a pillow. You can figure it's kind of like a flat thing, right? And he literally tipped it up. This will be the house of God. <laughs> this rock. And another natural reaction. And I will give a tenth to you. This is before the law. He's like, surely you're going to bless me and I will bless you in return. This, this, this is like his natural reaction to be in the house of God. I'm going to worship God. Like clearly, God is alive. I'm going to worship him. Like this... This is real. This is real. The natural reaction to being in the presence of God is devotion to God. The nat you, don't have to, you don't have to use gimmicks. You don't, I mean, you, you don't, I'm like, we don't have to make, we don't have to dress God up nice and pretty. We don't, we don't, I mean, like, we just say, here's the real God. The problem when you're talking to people about God and you don't give them the real God, you have to keep up the fake God. You have to keep coming up with excuses why the stuff that you promised didn't happen. Right? Like, you're probably going to get sick again. Like, your family's probably going to have some hard times, but God will still be good. Right? Natural reaction to being, whoa, in God's, wow, presence, wow, is devotion to God. And it was always God's desire that he would live with his people. It was always his desire. He created the garden. That was God's idea. The garden was his idea. He made the garden to live with man. Man messed it up, right? That wasn't God. Man messed it up. And so in the garden, he wanted to live with people. And Moses was, uh, was in the desert. I don't, you, know, you know how they got there. He was in the desert. And God says to him in Exodus 25, 8, he says, he says to Moses, let them, the people, construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them that I may dwell among them. God wanted them to build a building because man just needed that. We needed a building. God didn't need it. We needed it. Everybody had temples. We needed a temple. God's like, all right, here's what we'll do. Build something that I may dwell among them. And so they built this. They built uh, this, uh, this tabernacle uh, in, the, in, the, in the desert. And uh, it was like a portable tent that the for the house of God. It was God's tent, right? It wasn't even a building. It was a tent. And so we see they, 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 they dedicated it. And in Exodus chapter 40, God kept his word. Then the cloud covered the tent. Remember we talked about that last week, the presence coming upon you. Yeah. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory filled the tabernacle. The cloud covered it and the glory filled it. The cloud covered it the glory filled it. The cloud covered it, and the glory filled it. 
And this was God's desire. This is foreshadowing to a better covenant that we would have. So when we come into the promised land, the, 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 the people of Israel came into the promised land. And uh, he had them, uh, they had them build a, a, a temple, a full temple. Uh, and I think I have a little picture of it here. This is an actual picture of the temple. Yeah. Yeah, they took that about 700, no, no about 17, 2700 years ago, they took that right there. They use a drone, I think. That's how they got that angle right there. That might be a fictionalized account. So, they, so, so they, they built this temple exactly according to God's specifications. And uh, the same thing happened. God told them exactly how he wanted it built. He said, build this exactly according to my plans. Right? This is important. Build this temple according to my plans. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, the glory of the Lord filled this temple. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. And so they worshiped at this temple. They would bring their sacrifices there. They would bring their offerings there. Uh, once a year, they would go into the most holy place where God's presence was, and they would uh, uh, enter in, and they would do certain things inside the holy of holies. Uh, but this is where man would interact with God. There was a meeting place with God on the earth. Does that make sense? There was a meeting place with God on the earth. You couldn't just have two or three people together and you say, well, I'm tired of the temple. We're going to start our own temple. It didn't work that way, right? You needed the glory of God for it to be a temple. And so as time went on, uh, years went by, and then Jesus shows up on the scene. In John chapter 1, verse 14, this is what it says about Jesus. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt, remember this word, dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the presence dwelling and the glory, the glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, right? And so Jesus moves on the scene, and Jesus was the temple of God on earth. Jesus was the temple of God on earth. Now, there was a problem with that because he acted like it. He acted like he was a temple of God, and people were upset because they already had a temple. And that's the world we live in. People don't really like the fact that God is here and it's not their God. Right? Like, people, like, like that's, that is the big conflict with the world. Like, we don't say any way is, 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 is an okay way, right? And, and we actually, and they're like, well, then how do you know your religion is right? I'm like, because I met my religion. I met him. I met him. I didn't get convinced of a philosophy. I actually met Jesus. I met him. And any man who predicts his own death and resurrection and then carries it out, I follow. It's not a complicated construct there, right? Like, you predict it, that you will be murdered, and three days later you will come back from the dead. I follow you. That's it. That's it. You just said, I follow you, right? That's it. And so he predicted it, and, and he did it, and, and we follow because I met him right? I, I actually met him, and he was a temple. How do we know he was a temple? Look at this. John chapter 2, just the very next verse. They said to, Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. They're like, this big building, this big thing that we just showed you, how are you going to destroy that thing? Verse 20, and uh, the Jews said, it took us 46 years to build this temple, and you say you can build it in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. See, there was no glory in their temple in that day. The presence had already left. The glory had already left. We know that because the emperor walked into the Holy of Holies and nothing happened. The glory had already departed the temple. The glory returned. In the body of Jesus. Jesus is like, you'll know, but the temple is here. If you want to meet God, uh, it's right here. There is a meeting place on earth, and his name is Jesus when he walked the earth. How do we know this? How do we, how, how do, how do we know that? I mean, well, what did we get when we had Jesus? What did we get? The angels. The angels were always, there was always activity, right? Remember when he got baptized and the voice of the Father boomed over him? We have the voice of God. We, we have presence. 
healings, miracles, the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God was always the old covenant indicator that someone had received the anointing. So out of Jesus came this amazing wisdom. They're saying, how does he teach like this? Because of the wisdom of God that came out of him. So Jesus was the walking temple of God while he was on earth. Are you guys getting this? This is important. This is important. So Jesus said, hey, no, three days later, this temple will be raised up. You know, destroy this temple and, and it'll be raised up on the third day. And like, what temple are you talking about? This one right here. Now, you can imagine that was offensive to some people. That was a little bit offensive to some people because they kind of liked their temple and it wasn't a human, right? So I want you to see something now. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let's go back to this. When the day of Pentecost had come, they are all together in one place. And suddenly there came a, from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested, watch this, on each one of them. That's the power of God upon them. And they were all filled. The glory rested, or the, the presence rested on them, and the glory filled them. And they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Out of them became rivers of living water. You remember the temple in the book of Revelation? And out of it comes the river, of, and everywhere the river leads, there's life. Out of your belly, he promised, would be rivers of living water. As the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, this is important because Jesus was the temple. First, the temple was where Jacob had encountered God, and we knew that it was a meeting place of heaven. Then the tabernacle became the meeting place. It was the temple. Then the actual temple was built. There was a temple. But then the glory left that temple. Then Jesus came down filled and empowered. He had the power and the presence within him, filled with glory. Jesus was murdered, and he ascended into heaven. He said, but wait for I will send you the promise of my Father. The promise is not just the power upon you. And we can so be validated by the power upon us, but there is an even greater empowering that Jesus promised us, that we will be filled. Hear me, that we literally would become the temple of God. We would become the temple of God. We would become the temple of God. And when we become the temple of God, since we have the power upon us and we have the presence within us, wherever we go, we can expect whatever happened in the temple to happen. The voice of God. I mean, that's why he gives gifts, that the Lord may speak to his people. Now, clearly, we're not God and we get it wrong. That's why we don't talk like we are God, right? That's why we don't give prophetic words anymore like, thus saith the Lord. We don't say that. We don't say that because it's probably you and God. We see in part, we prophesy in part. But we speak for God. Anytime you tell somebody about Jesus, you're speaking for God. That's what the Bible tells us. We can expect angelic activity in our life. We can expect a voice. Watch this. Wherever you go as the temple of God is the meeting place of heaven and earth. Do you see this? It's the meeting place of heaven and earth because heaven is in you. Now, you can come to all kind of weird, weird conclusions from that. But just because you can come to weird conclusions doesn't mean we're going to shy back from the truth that you are the meeting place of heaven and earth. And so is every other believer. That's the important part. I really, <clears throat> as we begin to move, as God begins to move even more in our midst, my key, especially to, to, to young believers, is don't worship what's on you. Worship what's in you. I'm going to say that again. Don't worship what's on you. Worship what's in you. Worship the love of God that has been implanted in you. Do not worship the gifts that God has put upon you. They will disappoint you. 
Because the gifts upon you won't heal your marriage. They won't heal your family. They're not going to fix your finances. It's not going to heal your broken heart. It's not going to make you feel better about yourself. It's what's in you that does all that. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's in you that will bring you the spirit of adoption. It's a Holy Ghost of God that's in you that will heal your broken heart. It is a Spirit of God that's in you that will make you not need to perform to receive people's acceptance. It's a presence of God in you that changes the world. What's on you will cause a sign. What's on you will draw attention. What's on you can put other people into contact with God. What's on you can absolutely shift people's lives. But what's in you will sustain it. What's in you will keep it from failing. What's in you will keep it from, be, from, from all of your gifts and signs and wonders from being smirched by your failure. Does that make sense? There's a promise that Ezekiel had that. So many people just kind of dismissed in the days of Jesus. He said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, I, I tell people this all the time, and I just think, I think they don't believe me. Now, I, I, I prayed and I fasted for the gifts, Mike. I, I, I contended for healing for years. Pray, I laid hands on so many people, and some got healed, uh, many didn't. I, 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 went, I went in for a long time with prayer and fasting so that people who join this church today, they just see it right away, right? Like, I want that so desperately. I went after it so much, and yet I tell people today still, the anointing is the easy part. The anointing is the easy part of ministry. We can so be justified by our anointing. The anointing is the easy part. The hard part is being faithful to God and allowing Him to do the internal work that it takes to sustain what is on your life. Being vulnerable with people. Being vulnerable with your spouse. Being vulnerable with the people around you. To actually allow God to touch some of the idols in your heart. To, to acknowledge that you are on a healing journey. I, uh, <clears throat> I used to dream of just sweeping revivals. Just sweeping revival. And today I just really dream about whole people. Whole people. Like, my dreams in the days were like shopping centers giving their lives to Christ over the announcements, right? My dreams today are like a spouse in the middle of an argument saying, you know what, I was being insecure when I said that. Let, can we start over? Does that sound small? I hope it doesn't. Because I feel like that changes generations. I've just seen a lot of people have the anointing come upon them and it never got in them and didn't, there was no lasting fruit. I've baptized people that I never saw again. When you see somebody overcome with the love of God on the inside of them, like, you can't take that away. That just, that never goes away. And that's what we're contending for. Hallelujah. Come on up, Mike. My prayer for you in this house is that the presence of God will come upon you in a significant way and you would be filled with the Spirit. Now, the last two weeks, I've laid out theologically what I plan on preaching for the next several years. At Revival Life Church, we live to connect people with the presence and power of God. In that order. First in you, then on you. I want what's in you to be far greater than what's on you, and I want what's on you to be amazing. Stand with me. <clears throat> I... um.
Tuesday night, I had the, I had the joy of going to a, um, a young adult worship something. I don't even know what it was, to be honest with you. But I was there. Corey was leading worship. My daughter was uh, on worship as well. And uh, Rebecca was there playing her guitar. And uh, there's a bunch of young people. A bunch of young people who love Jesus, love God. They're on a Tuesday night worshiping God. <clears throat> and uh, had an altar call at the end, you know, if you just want ministry. And I'm down to minister, right? And so I'm there, and I'm praying for people. And, uh, and uh, they, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm going to. And they told Corey, don't pray in tongues on the mic, like, because there's all kind of different people here, right? Like, whatever, you know, you know, like, we can, whatever. So he didn't pray in tongues. And so, like, I'm, I'm praying, and, like, this kid hits the ground, and I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, like, I didn't mean to, like, he's falling. I'm trying to make him fall slow, you know, because that wasn't the goal, you know. And uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to offend you with God showing up. Um, I for, forgive me, that's not what I meant. Forgive me, Jesus, that's not what I meant. And I'm praying for these young people, and it was like they'd never heard that God loves them. And I'm praying for these people. And this young girl, I just had a prophetic word for her, and I had to put her hand on her heart, and put my hand on her hand, and begin telling her about how much God loves her, and how he cares about her life, and certain things were never his plan and as I'm praying for her I could just feel her tears dripping onto my hand and my heart was like God loves these, these, these young people with no pastor as someone had told them that worship was enough and going to an event was enough but God actually wants to live on the inside of them that they would be the temple of God So when we talk about Acts chapter 2 and the filling of the Holy Ghost, we don't, we're not talking about screaming in tongues. Though we're fine with screaming in tongues. We're not talking about running around the room, though we're fine with running around the room. We're not talking about hitting the ground, though we're okay with hitting the ground. We're not talking about seeing fire, but we're okay with fire. We, we say God can do whatever He wants, but what we're really after is seeing people filled with the love of the Father in a way that manifests in their physical body in a way that manifests in their lives, in a way that manifests that the people around them can see. See, when I got touched by the love of God, when I got touched with the love of God, when I actually went from just being empowered to filled with the love of the Father, then my angry ministry stopped. And I could actually be a father. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We love you today, Father God. We love you today, Father God. And Father, we say to mm, ha. Huh. We say today the world needs your presence and power. The world needs your presence and power. Say it with me. The world needs your presence and power. And Father, I thank you that these people right here are the temple of God. The carriers of your presence and power for the world. And the presence and power that's on them is the same presence and power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. So, Father, I pray this week, I pray that they would just so be in tune with the presence of God that's on the inside of them. The love of the Father that's bubbling up out of their belly. They would be sensitive to the words of love that you would have them speak to people who don't know you. Because this means nothing if we don't share it. I pray that they would be convicted that the world needs to know about this love. I pray that they will be overwhelmed with compassion for the people that you are overwhelmed with compassion for. Wow. I pray, I pray, Father, that they would see the hurting the same way that Jesus saw us hurting and decided to get off his throne and put on flesh. Father, I pray that we would not hide behind what's on us, but we would keep on flesh. And we would be real with the people around us, unashamed of the healing journey that we're on. Oh, Lord Jesus. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, Shekaba, right now in the name of Jesus, that you would fill with your love and compassion. Ha, right now that you would come and you would fill, you would fill with your spirit, not some sort of performance thing, but the love of God, the glory filling the temple. Your pure and holy glory filling the temple. That you would bring healing in love in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, hey, listen, if you think this message is for you, you need to be filled. I want to lay hands on a couple people. I'm going to be right here at the front, but Corey's going to come and close us out. Oh, wow. Can you give it up for the word this morning? That was powerful, amen. If you would like prayer, I'd like to, again, just invite you forward. Um, Pastor Carl is going to be up here. and um, Our ministry team, you can come forward as well. Um, if you need healing in your body, if you had a hard week, um, if, you just, if you just want someone to just to bless you real good, we're going to have people up here who want to pray for you. Amen. But, um, hey, can we give it up for what God's doing in our house, in our church, in our community? I just want to just pray over you again real quick. Father, I just pray that we would be a people um, who, who would live healed, would live whole, who live healed, who live whole, and who would carry the gift, the calling, the presence, the anointing well with character, with integrity, with love, with compassion, with kindness, a people who are not afraid of our scars, of our shortcomings, of what we've been through. I just pray that it would all give you glory in Jesus' name. Can you give it up for God one more time? Give it up for the word one more time. Bless somebody as you go. Have an amazing Sunday. Join us next Friday night at 730 for our Moving Mountains uh, series and through uh, the month of July. We love you guys. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Have an amazing day.